Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another interesting and inspiring episode of Women's Day Facebook Live series. This is Aparna Mishra, founder editor of Women Shine. Welcomes our speaker of, of the day, Nidhi Khare, to the FB Live. Hi. Welcome, Nidhi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Nidhi Khare is presently additional secretary in Department of Consumer Affairs. She is an IS officer of 1992 batch from Jharkhand cadre. She has held several important administrative posts, such as administrator of Patna Municipal Corporation and collector of Jamshedpur, Madhubani, and Dumka districts. She has worked in the sectors of education, labor, health, disability, environment, and finance. She has also worked relentlessly to empower women by making successful self-help groups to facilitate their literacy under Total Literacy Campaign and help them with microfinance and livelihood projects like poultry, dairy, fishery, tussle thread reeling, and weaving. She has traveled extensively across the world to places like USA, Netherlands, France, Turkey, Thailand, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. I think Nidhi koi jage bachi ho to bata do. <laughs> Antarctica. <laughs> okay, Antarctica. That's on the bucket list. Okay. So now she she's also a trained classical Hindustani vocalist and loves to spend her time reading extensively on diverse subjects like anthropology, economics, and history. She has a keen interest in arts and has mentored social activists engaged in public service. So this was a very little introduction which I can give. There's a whole lot of good things which she has done in her career. So I would request Rini to take the discussion forward. First of all, wishing you a very happy Women's Week, ma'am. You too, all of you. Thank you. Today, it gives me immense pleasure that I got this opportunity to have a chat with you and listen to what all you have done and how you have done. And I hope all the women out there are also eager to listen about your journey, struggles and motivations. Right. So let's begin. How does it feel to be an IS officer since this comes with a lot of hard work? And what changes have occurred in your life after being at this position for 30 years? Yeah, so actually, um, uh, it still feels, you know, that uh, it was just the other day that I had joined. And uh, uh, it is, uh, it's a life uh, full of challenges. Uh, there's a lot of diversity of portfolios. So it exposes you to so many, you know, worlds. And uh, it also gives you a lot of uh, satisfaction or fulfilling, uh, you know, whatever inspiration you came uh, with in the service. And I feel that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's not that I really wanted to be in the IS. Uh, in fact, I wanted to be a scientist. But uh, when I saw, you know, there was uh, at one point of time, uh, I had to choose whether, you know, for pursuing science, uh, research in science. And uh, I had been selected in a nuclear medicine uh, for my PhD. But uh, most of the, you know, cutting edge uh, research actually uh, were outside our country. And uh, so th that moment came where uh, you had to decide whether your rest of your life would be spent outside of India or uh, one could do something in the country. And uh, since uh, from the very beginning, I was, uh, you know, I was very concerned about things around me. And uh, many times, you know, I also used to wonder why there is so much of squalor, so much of corruption, illiteracy, uh, status of women, status of, uh, you know, other people, and uh, why we have an exploitative kind of a world where, uh, so these were the things. And it, I used to wonder, you know, uh, who's running the country, you know, so I have to be there. I wanted to be on that stage where we could plan better for the future of, uh, you know, our country. 
and for betterment of our countrymen. So, uh, but I didn't know that, you know, it's basically the elite bureaucracy uh, as an IS, which uh, deals with these things. So when I was, uh, you know, um, faced with this challenge, then I said, okay, let me just burn the bridges. And uh, I gave up that career, career option. And then I said, okay, now let me, uh, you know, take whatever is the best in the country. And then I, I will kind of serve my people. So it is with that, uh, you know, thing which I came. And I think uh, in 30 years, I can be proud of, uh, you know, some of my work since I have worked in one of the most backward, uh, say, places in India, which is Bihar and Jharkhand. And in every posting, I have tried to make a difference. So there has never been a, a dull moment, so to say. So I think India is definitely proud to have an officer like you. Definitely. Thanks. So what is your motivation behind being an officer? And what kept you moving throughout these years, like you serving in backward areas and everything that you did? Uh, you see, as I said, uh, that uh, I was as a uh, as a teenager and also then in the university also, I was very concerned with uh, the social issues which were happening or say incidents which were happening in and around, you know, our society, our state and also in our country. And uh, I could see that, uh, you know, poverty was a big thing. It was a big block. Uh, an obstruction to many people who wanted to, you know, who were aspiring for a better dream. Uh, there were issues of uh, problems of infrastructure. Uh, you would recollect, you know, there was at uh, one point of time, the country, uh, the country's uh, financial uh, things were so bad that virtually we had to, uh, I mean, we had to keep the bullion uh, the gold, you know, for uh, getting our stuff. So this was something which was, uh, you know, I was uh, looking around uh, at the crushing poverty all around us, you know, lack of employment, lack of uh, infrastructure, as I said. Uh, people could not excel in the fields that uh, they wanted to. And I really wanted to make a difference. I wanted, you know, that power so that I could empower everybody. So it was with this, uh, you know, thought that I used to think uh, if I, you know, if I wanted to really uh, pursue my dream and had to leave my country, I used to think uh, then who will take care of my country? So in that sense, I used to feel that if I am looking at the problem, then I have to be part of that solution. So that's what uh, kept me moving because it is after all a very, uh, it's a great struggle. You know, it's, uh, I'm sure for uh, many of us, uh, people uh, think that, you know, you enjoy uh, status, you enjoy power, you have, uh, you have no, nothing to work uh, with and you are only lauding, you know, because you are an IS officer, but it is not so uh, in our lives, you know. Uh, one is kind of 24 hours, seven working, and uh, in certain positions, you just cannot take leave also. There would be festivals which you are, you know, uh, your duty is there. So uh, there are many things, you know, you keep, uh, you will have to, you know, go sacrifice in that sense. There'll be many things which you cannot do because people are looking up to you. Uh, you wouldn't uh, uh, believe, but uh, before I turned 30, I was already collector of Madhubani. So, I mean, people looked at me uh, with such reverence that uh, I too had to, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, come true to uh, their uh, say aspirations yeah and fulfill uh, you know the promise that they saw in me in madhubani for example 
when i uh, when i uh, looked at the women's literacy levels they were pathetic just about 30 to 40% women uh, were literate in the district so when i took up uh, total literacy campaigns and uh, you know ran them like uh, as you see you know like politicians do women would come up to me they would touch my hand they would you know the older women uh, would kind of bless me uh, because they understood that being illiterate had uh, cost them so dearly for the poor to remain illiterate uh, it robs them of all opportunities to move forward they are exploited they are uh, you know they are uh, not given the correct uh, wages for example uh, in the banks or say every uh, say every step you know they actually counter so much of uh, you know it's like a barrier that they counter so one could see you know one could empathize that uh, even uh, say giving them uh, you know providing uh, this kind of a campaign uh, was actually making so much of a difference to the to the ordinary person so this is what is very fulfilling you know when you see you have been able to empower people it is the most beautiful thing and it is the most satisfying thing and you then do not uh, really you know all this botheration all the sacrifices all the hard work everything just pales into insignificance that's that is how beautifully you have just narrated a simple example but with so much deep meaning that's it's wonderful today in the time of modernization people are heavily influenced by western countries but they do not realize that condition of a women have been better off in comparison to those countries since past would you like to reflect upon this issue yeah there is uh, you know uh, for example uh, when we are celebrating you know uh, the international women's uh, day on the 8th of march uh, we are actually uh, we do not understand you know the background in which Uh, women in western world had to deal uh, with uh, you know coming out and uh, protesting uh, and basically making a case for uh, their rights in our country thankfully for example i mean we didn't have to really fight for our rights uh, separately right so uh, when uh, we were given uh, you know voting rights women got them automatically nobody questioned that women cannot vote for example yeah. so the universal suffrage came immediately and nobody even discussed whether women need to be given this right or not similarly uh, even in uh, say uh, recruitments nobody questioned that uh, as a woman would you be able to do uh, your duties as an ias officer or an ips officer or in the forest uh, services or any of the civil services it is given that uh, you as a citizen have an equal opportunity before the constitution uh, of india and nationally you will have to you know make uh, yourself suitable to the job but otherwise the state was not against women uh, as such uh even if you see you know uh, like uh, now the marriages have uh, been started uh, you know getting registered and the state uh, is basically uh, trying to get all marriages registered uh, but uh, say 70 years back 50 years back everyone was married there was no paper no chit of paper to prove whether you were married or not married the society uh, gave you so much of power as a woman that uh, nobody would question that you are not a wife and even if uh, say whatever happened the couples remained together now uh, i'll just say that uh, just to give an example today in the usa 
you have 19% children who are not living with their biological parents. Okay. Only 19% of children are actually, sorry, uh, only 19% of children are living with their biological parents, That's which means that a huge number of children who are born are either living with one biological parent or the other, which may be a father or a mother, or they are not living with uh, biological parents. Yeah. So do we know this in, in our country? We do not. And what has happened is when you keep asking for freedom, for individual rights, for uh, say for your own rights as a woman then what happens is it has now become so skewed that in the western world people are simply uh, i mean that is how people are not marrying first in the first place and uh, they are uh, you know, there are other things which are happening in their society which we are not aware of so uh, to me i think uh, we must understand that there has to be a harmony between, uh, say, freedom, your individual rights, and your responsibility. Because right. your responsibility cannot uh, be simply thrown away just because you want, uh, you know, or say an individual wants his individual rights to be protected. So somewhere... Uh, I should also say that, you know, uh, people like us who are uh, who are in public uh, sphere and there are many of us like this, uh, we have to, uh, I mean, I owe my success in that uh, sense uh, to the families, people who support it, you know, whether it is my family or my in-laws. Uh, there was such a great support system, which we today, uh, you know, or say our generation of people or the next generation of people uh, think that they can take it for granted, that they will exist forever for us. Yes. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that unless we invest in these systems, which we have inherited and which have been the support system of uh, so many successful people, we will not be able to actually uh, go uh, very far. Yes. Today, Indian families are, uh, even in the West, uh, they are most envied because their children are uh, moving ahead. Uh, they are uh, the next generation uh, technocrats in uh, that country and wherever. I mean, it's not just USA, uh, the all entire the country, all countries. Yeah, all the Western countries. So Indians are envied and respected because uh, people feel that uh, they, they all come from very strong family values, which is looking after each other, helping each other, taking responsibility without, uh, you know, making a grimace and taking it naturally, you know. Yeah. So these are the valued uh, things which once we lose, it will be very difficult to, you know, uh, to kind of re-figure it out again for the next generation. That is true. Indian history is filled with examples of queens ruling, uh, being in battlefield, ruling without husbands or even kings, and just looking out for other people and their welfare. What do you think this tells us about the women in ancient India? And also tell us about the present scenario. So as I was already, uh, you know, we were reflecting about this. Um, you know, um, I have, for example, uh, I've worked in Bihar and Jharkhand. I've never been questioned by ordinary people about my uh, capabilities, for example. I never was uh, questioned by neither my, uh, say, colleagues or subordinates or masses, whether I'll be able to control a riot, whether I'll be, uh, you know, whether I'll be effective in a law and order situation, 
whether I'll be able to solve you know, financial problems, whether I'll be able to understand, whether I'll be able to be available 24 hours, 7, never, nobody, nobody ever uh, kind of uh, judged you on gender. In fact, the positive thing was because of, uh, you know, you being a woman, uh, people thought that you are sympathetic, you know, you are uh, empathetic. Uh, you understand what, uh, you know, uh, women are often shy of telling anybody. Uh, even for men, you know, something which uh, people want to say, but they know that, you know, uh, a man would require, you know, a lot of, uh, say, articulation. But a woman understands very, very quickly <laughs> what somebody wants to tell, right? So... Uh, and I, I feel uh, that uh, these illiterate people, these poor people who have not been to, you know, any great uh, universities or any great schools of uh, learning, even they never uh, ever made any comment whether, you know, they are safe, whether they are fine uh, with me as their collector or some such thing. So... Uh, I started questioning why in our country uh, people show so much of, you know, uh, their reaction to a woman, so to say, is very neutral. In fact, uh, they just took you for who you were. That's all. And uh, that is why I say that, uh, you know, in our ancient uh, history also, even in our scriptures, you know, Indian books uh, or say Indian uh, traditions, you have this concept of Ardhanarishwar, where everyone understands that uh, a man cannot be complete without a woman. And this is like, this is etched in our collective civilizational memory. And uh, that is how uh, for a woman uh, to succeed in our country is far easier because we never had to actually uh, you know face those barriers which women in other parts of the uh, you know world had to face because there were issues of uh, you know religion scriptures and such other things in our country you can see uh, ahilya bai holkar she became widowed and she then became a queen and ruled for 40 years. Nobody questioned that she is only a woman. There have been so many uh, queens and, you know, uh, ranis who have uh, taken on to the battle, riding, you know, and facing the enemies uh, virtually uh, right there. You know, so they were not as if they were only the backstage uh, maneuvering, manipulating kind of, you know, queens who were only uh, kind of uh, playing palace politics. These queens were upfront. They were there. So this has, so what I'm trying to say is that for women to succeed in India is actually uh, comes from huge legitimacy that society as a whole has uh, given to women. There have been issues, okay, of safety, where, uh, you know, people have been targeted and there will be crimes. But I see uh, so many women, young women, rubbing out, coming out, struggling and uh, doing their work. This is like uh, very, very healthy. We may still have, uh, you know, problems. But then uh, life will be, you know, full of uh, challenges. So one will have to deal with them. And I think our women are uh, continuously, consistently, they are making such a huge impact. Uh, whether it is on the shaping of, uh, you know, our country, whether it is on taking the country forward on a growth path, or whether it is, you know, pulling and, uh, you know, providing inspiration to millions of people to, you know, make a name 
to kind of uh, come out and work together. So in that sense, I, I uh, feel uh, very, very blessed that uh, we didn't have to kind of uh, face uh, such barriers as other women, uh, you know, across the globe were facing. That's right. So there are women like that, but there is also a new genre of women emerging who have like a sense of disjoint or if we call them pseudo feminist. What do you have to uh, say about this new emerging trend in this society? Uh, now, this is something, uh, you know, very um, painful. And I think uh, it is only because, you know, uh, women who uh, have not been uh, to, say, rural areas, they have no idea how much women actually in our country are toiling and they are working and they are making a name for themselves and as i said also sharing responsibilities and as i also said that sharing responsibility whether it is equal or not what is important is women uh, must be taught that uh, while you ask for your rights you should also understand that there is a great responsibility uh, towards uh, the women uh, you see uh, how Amul, uh, you know, the the whole Amul uh, movement became successful. It is on the shoulders of women. And these women are in the federation. Today they are, uh, you know, uh, on great positions. But at the same time, uh, they have been also proud homemakers. Yes. And this is something which I feel uh, that uh, that some people uh, think that, you know, uh, that's an unglamorous work or this is something which others need to do. And, uh, you know, one needs to kind of decouple from uh, this whole responsibility thing, which is what has led to, you know, pseudo uh, uh, sense of uh, victimhood. Uh, creating victims out of women where it is not required, uh, trying to instill in young girls that uh, you are the exploited lot, that you will, uh, you know, you will have to keep fighting, you know. And so what has happened is that in the process, uh, such people are actually leaving uh, the great uh, embodiments which i may say of women so for example as i said that uh, women are far more intuitive they are far more empathetic uh, they are far more caring nurturing and this is something which uh, women should not lose just because you know if you are in a race to become equal with men i'm sorry that's not uh, that's Thank not you how I view because already you are much stronger <laughs> what is the need to you know compete mm -hmm. so if uh, and the competition with uh, becoming a man is so ludicrous that uh, you often find women smoking taking to you know alcohol or whatever I I don't uh, that's something which I find we can do without we are passionate, we, we have hobbies, we are not, uh, you know, like I see my uh, men colleague in just one color, linear thinking, we are not like that. We are very, we have, you know, a 360 degree view of anything, right? So uh, as a woman, you have far greater capacities. So do not kill that capacity just to be equal to somebody. That's not, if that is the, you know, if that is a basis of, uh, you know, agitation, then I think uh, we are going, uh, you know, a wrong way. So what do you think women should aim for themselves comparison or better rights? And like, why is that? No, so, uh, so first of all, uh, as I said, that every uh, woman should educate uh, 
should get education uh, should try to make uh, you know a living uh, i mean try to kind of skill herself even if uh, she is a homemaker that also requires lot of skills so skills are very very fundamental and uh, the other thing which i said was the the responsibility and uh, you know creating a very harmonious uh say balance between work and home is very very fundamental because i feel that uh, there are women who are not uh, you know in harmony not in sync with this balance and then you take uh, your sentiments to the office too so you have to be good you keep learning you have passions about uh, learning new things uh, follow your hobbies that will make you uh, even much more exposed to the multi dimensional learning of different things uh, and as i uh, as i also feel that uh, whatever you learn never gets wasted that is absolutely so this information which you are learning from you know some other field which is not related to your work uh, will ultimately provide you you know some uh, an extra dimension to what you are doing and that's <clears throat> so that's what uh, makes you very very unique mm -hmm. and uh, i think uh, even when you know like you interact with people outside for example um, when i uh, went for my studies to usa uh, we had you know in a small group uh, a japanese uh, officer also who had served in india and when i asked him uh, what is it that he finds in india uh, which is very good or something which is very impressionable for uh, a person outside of the country uh, he remarked that you know uh, you are very uniquely placed you do not know and that's what this is how he said he said that you know uh, he had worked in several cities of india so it was delhi bangalore uh, mumbai chennai everywhere so he says that you know whatever uh, time of the day uh, you kind of when you are on the roads you can see women of all kinds uh people who are uh, wearing sarees uh having flowers on their hair and they are all going to their work <clears throat> they could be you know vegetable sellers they could be on the scooters uh maybe they are teachers uh they also he also said that uh, so many bureaucrats i have seen so many ceos of you know uh, different companies i have met uh they are all women and the ease with which indian women have been able to balance work and tradition uh work and home uh you know your commitments in office uh vis-a-vis -vis your your commitments with your family members he says it's simply unique he says uh so you know as a as an indian you may not realize Uh, how you are viewed by an outside uh, society but uh, these are the things which are your um, these are the power that uh, an indian woman actually holds with herself that uh, i would not personally like uh, the next generation to lose uh, in any context So yeah, India has rich culture, rich and unique culture of traditions and values. So, how do you think we can imbibe that in our lives? As like foreign countries are recognizing that, but how do you think we, as people of our country, should reflect upon and imbibe that in our lives, in our daily lives? See, I think uh, much was because of uh, you know the wisdom of our uh, collective civilization, uh, which first of all. Uh, which was based on karma which was based on you know whatever good you do will come back to you yeah. so it uh, inspired everyone to you know keep doing that good 
individually and also collectively uh, to anybody and everybody. So uh, when you are in sync, uh, you know, with your individual and to the world outside, uh, you are able to make sense of the life uh, and whatever challenges it is throwing at you. So one is that uh, perhaps this is the basis, you know, the, that spiritual richness, which I found in illiterate masses, in impoverished uh, people, which has, uh, you know, which uh, motivated them to keep going, you know, to keep uh, doing their work honestly, uh, keep doing their work with the best possible way and try to uh, inculcate these values in their children. Yes. I think uh, all of us, you know, all of us, I think, have witnessed uh, heroic deeds of sacrifice of our parents, of our mother, of our uh, grandparents, you know, extended family people, and, uh, you know, a nice neighbor, somebody who helped you out. So I think that is something which is very, very unique uh, to our country and to our society. And it is very, very positive also. It does not uh, make a person isolated uh, in their times of uh, difficulty. Yes. And similarly, it also keeps you rooted uh, when you have made it big. So this sense of equanimity, uh, the sense of, you know, duty, sense of uh, responsibility, as I said, it is not just towards your parents or towards your children, but this sense of uh, responsibility further grows, uh, you know, outside your circle of, uh, say, people whom you know or whom you feel accountable to. So uh, that sense of responsibility also goes to the uh, living and to the non-living entities which make up the entire ecosystem in which we are living. So I think uh, when you have that uh, feeling of gratitude, when you have that uh, spiritual, uh, say, richness, uh, it will, you know, and as I see uh, that people are making, uh, you know, a huge difference in the way our country uh, was, say, 30 years back, and how uh, our country has moved forward. Uh, and together, you know, it's not that now one place is very, very deficient or uh, one locality is like very, very poor. So it is universally, you can see that the standard of living is improving. Universally, you can see that people are becoming literate. People are getting, uh, you know, skilled. People are also getting, uh, you know, used to facing women in, uh, say, in much greater number in our workforce. Yeah. So it is something which is, uh, I mean, I find it very, very, uh, very, very remarkable, something which I can be very, very proud of. And I think I, we must all, uh, you know, fulfill that dream where we can also help other societies who are struggling uh, with uh, difficulties, you know, to come forward and to, uh, to understand that all, uh, I mean, we are ultimately children of nature. Today is a hand of help to anybody who need it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So then, uh, as you know, somebody has said that with great power comes great responsibility. I think uh, when India collectively moves ahead as a nation to become uh, very, very powerful, uh, then all of us also must become responsible uh, to ensure that, you know, uh, in other parts of the country or in other parts of the world, uh, wherever help is required, we should be helping them out. That's right. what, what role does a male figure plays in the life of a woman, be it any role they are in? 
No, males are very nice. <laughs> they are very dear. Uh, at least personally, I would say, uh, if it was not for the males uh, in my family, whether it was my father, my brother, then my husband also, my sons, they're all, and my colleagues, my subordinates, my friends. I think uh, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot look at the world in this gender sense. We must understand that nature has devised, uh, you know, the human race to be like this. Yes. And the males do provide uh, something very, very, um, something which uh, women, uh, first of all, will not have. For example, I, uh, when I am working, I am like very passionately working in my, uh, in my assignment. So I do not know about the gossips. <laughs> so it is the males <laughs> who will tell you, okay, what, what's happening where? What so did you is, miss? What did I miss? And uh, so they, that's very, very, uh, very, very important. The other thing is that uh, sometimes uh, women uh, are very emotional. Yes. So men are able to, uh, you know, for them, the problem uh, to the solution uh, is a very linear path. And so they are able to, you know, uh, kind of dis uh, dismember the problem uh, into, you know, small uh, achievable goals. And uh, so they are very, very adept at solving, uh, you know, problems like this. Problems which are emotional, they are not able to figure out. But uh, problems which are, uh, you know, uh, kind I of uh, non-emotional problems. <laughs> so they are quite good at it. <laughs> that is rightfully said. <laughs> and I think uh, we should be very grateful to the men of our country because they have also changed, you know, as women have changed, as their status has changed, as uh, women have become more powerful in uh, the working uh, force. I think men have also similarly, you know, they have adapted themselves. They have also adopted many things. And uh, I think now you can see uh, men who are very, empathetic, uh, who are much more, uh, say, giving in nature and uh, more respectful. Uh, so I, I think uh, that uh, more respectful and, you know, they are ready to give you the due. So uh, very encouraging. So I think uh, at least in India, I feel that, you know, uh, we are very uniquely placed and we must celebrate, uh, you know, for who we are and collectively, you know, together with men, uh, this is also an occasion to also thank them uh, to be who, you know, how supportive they were. And also to the women in our uh, lives, you know, it, it was my mother-in-law who was so supportive, my mother who kind of, uh, kind of dreamt it for me and so many other people. So one, one thing which I always uh, tell uh, the women colleagues in my office and other places is to also help, you know, women because uh, we as women must understand uh, if other women are facing any problem. So rather than be competitors or rather than uh, being viewed as, you know, uh, two women cannot be good friends, you know, some such things that we keep hearing. That I, I think we should, uh, yeah, we should kind of uh, uh, put an end to all such uh, so-called rumors. <laughs> yeah. So that was beautiful. That every word of yours was an inspiration to me and I guess any everybody who listened to it. So once again, I would like to thank you so much for taking out time from your busy, busy schedule to come here and talk about things at length. Thank you so much, ma'am.
थैंक यू सो मच अपर्णा थैंक यू सो मच our pleasure also you know it was in the beginning i said no it was it will be an inspiration uh, inspiring and interesting session so it was actually proved it was beautiful session idi all the best to you with your future uh, the future career it was very nice listening to you and the thoughts you know the thought process and everything it was so positivity was you know har cheez positive lag raha tha it was very optimistic kind of uh, discussion we had very nice of so being really enjoyed yeah we really enjoyed Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thanks so much.